Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. For more than 25 years, this TV series has explored a wide variety of issues related to peace, social justice, economic justice, and nonviolent social change. During this hour, we'll explore several dimensions of nonviolence. We'll discuss what violence nonviolence is and is not. We'll look at how and why nonviolence works. We'll examine nonviolence's practicality and its track record of accomplishments. We'll look at nonviolence as an important element in most religious traditions. And for example, it's an inherent and authentic part of the message that Jesus taught and lived. We'll consider nonviolence in the early church and in more recent religious expressions, including other faith traditions. We'll consider how to apply nonviolence in practical ways at the global scale and in our daily lives. So to do this, we have a very well-informed uh, guest who's a lot of fun to talk with. I'm happy to welcome somebody that I've known and respected for decades. He represented the United States in meetings held in India to plan the United Nations' most ambitious effort in its history on the subject of tonight's program building a culture of peace and nonviolence. Since 1994, he served as the national coordinator of the Lutheran Peace Fellowship. He continually inspires, informs, and empowers people to work for peace, both from a faith basis and just because we're all human beings. He has served as a guest on this program several times, and I'm delighted to welcome him back. So, Glenn Gersmill, good to have you here again. It's good to be here. Um, a good starting point uh, would be to ask why so many countries, and for that matter, so many people, have so much trouble with conflict and why these difficulties are so pervasive and so persistent. Mm -hmm. So what is it in our thinking and our thought patterns that right. keep us hooked on violence? And, and I think the first point is just to remind ourselves of that. For example, our prison population is twice what any other uh, comparable country is, and it's three or four times as many as some of them. You look at our, our uh, video games and, and computer games, the great majority uh, are violent or sexist or both, and uh, it's, um, it's not just uh, the ones in the background. They're the, the nine out of the top ten most popular ones week after week will mm -hmm. meet that standard. Um, you know, it's in our playgrounds, it's in our homes, it's in our workplaces, mm -hmm. it's in our ethnic relations, it's in our sporting events, it's mm -hmm. in our international relations. Yeah. I mean, it's just, there's something that's worth looking at when you have a phenomenon that is at that many different levels yeah. uh, of our experience. And, and, and violence is, is pervasive and it's persistent. We've had that right. in our culture, right. uh, not just our culture, but... Right widespread for, for a very long time. Pervasive, persistent, and perhaps a good word would be subconscious. I mean, it's uh -huh. just, it's below the visual level for most yeah. of us. Um, we, we, one of the ways of looking at this is this notion of a myth of redemptive violence. And right. I, uh, I wonder if you can explain that concept right. and see how well that reflects the reality. So well, we, first of all, I think the easiest way is to think of popular culture. <clears throat> If you look at Westerns, spy uh, stories, um, mysteries, um, you know, just every comics, uh, mm -hmm. cartoons, mm -hmm. every one of them have these, have conflicts that by and large are resolved, um, maybe not at first, usually it's the, the hero will struggle quite a bit, but ultimately they're resolved by greater force uh, mm -hmm. or more clever force by the, the winner. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this notion of a myth of redemptive violence is, is an interesting way of, of looking at that because <clears throat> it's not just that violence succeeds, but it's, there's something about it that is, that is held up as really good. Um, uh, war brings peace, you know? Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, you get the shootout on Main Street, and that finally resolves it, makes the, the western town safe again and then the the hero can ride off in the sunset right. and the bad guy wearing the black hat has been defeated right. it's this iconic uh ritual right. that plays out with a very predictable 
plot where good triumphs over evil in this ritualistic kind of way. Right. And it, it and somehow the violence then redeems us. It redeems that small western town. Right. And it plays out, like I say, in spy movies, video games, cartoons. Um, um, so that that's uh, and, and, and as we look at that kind of a pattern, and then we look at our foreign policy, or like you said, the prison system. You know, are we playing that out in our prison system? Right. Uh, right. Through the death penalty, for example, right. or do we play this out in, you know, bombing the bad guys? Right. I saw a statistic the other day that really um, reminded me of what you're talking about here. <clears throat> the average child graduates from high school having spent more hours in front of TV sets and, and other, you know, screens, screens um, entertainment screens we're mm -hmm. talking about, than all of the hours they spend in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Not just more than their civics class, more than all of them. Yeah. And the average child will have seen a thousand or to 10,000 times as many incidents where violence prevails in the way we're talking about then the kinds of ways of handling violence that, let's say, the people that devise the uh, conflict resolution programs that are in most schools nowadays, mm -hmm. and they're, they're totally outclassed. You know, they don't have yeah. a chance to, to get to the real fundamental way in which students think about the world. So, so when a conflict arises, whether it's at the local family or school or neighborhood level or at the global mm -hmm. scale, People jump to the solution that we've been programmed for the, through the, the movies and through the, right. this myth of redemptive violence rather than the, the better process that they might right. have learned through a conflict resolution right. program. And it's not every time, of course, but it's, it's this substrata, you know, it's the foundation. And it's because it's mostly mm -hmm. subconscious, it's even more powerful. Yeah. When you, when, in college, when you take a, like a psychology 101 class, they tell you, oh, you're programmed for either fight or flight. You either right. have to do a violent uh, response to a problem or run away. And this, this binary thinking exactly. is, is, uh, is limiting our creativity. Right. And, I mean, it's not that there aren't in every family and in every community and every playground, there aren't incidents where people are steering away from those two. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there is an alternative mm -hmm. or, or t alternatives. Yeah. Um, but again, the, the sort of boilerplate is really those two, fight or flight. Right, yeah. and, and, they, they, and they teach that in like Psychology 101, right. and, we, and it comes out in, in yes. the rhetoric of somebody running for office right. at the national level. You know, right. I'm gonna stand up and be tough, right. and, and otherwise my opponent is a wimp or whatever, right. you know, it's like this, right. this binary thing. Or my opponent is fighting unfair, you know, but, they're, but fighting, you, you assume, uh, is gonna be there. Yeah. It, 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 you know, you hear this thing about you have to fight fire with fire, but actually you don't fight fire with fire, you fight fire with water. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, there's, there's, there's an alternative out right. there that we commonly don't think of right. in, in the conflict situation. Um, so so if, if, if you have to use water to fight fire instead of fire to fight fire, that, that, that would say, well, we don't need to have a military solution to a foreign policy problem. We can have a, a solution that will actually cool things down. Right, right. You know. Um, what I, people sometimes refer to nonviolence as a third way then, to get out of that binary fight or right. flight approach. <clears throat> Tell us something of this concept of, of third way. Yeah, it, um, when you think of fight or flight, um, you, you know, you think of, on the one hand, uh, uh, aggression or power or whatever, and on the other hand, you think of weakness, um, you think of something that's less dynamic and so forth. And nonviolence isn't like a compromise between the two. It's not sitting between those two and drawing from each of them like sometimes mm -hmm. you see in situations. It's actually an entirely third alternative. It's like a triangle more rather than a line of, of options. Mm -hmm. And um, the irony is that it has vastly more creativity and possibilities and examples and, and uh, ways of approaching the problem than, than the uh, fight or flight. And uh, 
there are people that have grasped that and you see it all the time but in terms of being the really dominant metaphor and the ways we think about things over and over like you said in foreign policy we've tried diplomacy as far as we can go bring out the weapons you know mm -hmm. it's just and nobody nobody says well, wait a second isn't there any other way here right <laughs> well one of the things one of the concepts i like about exploring nonviolence is the way where a lot of successful nonviolent efforts have rewritten the script about what's going on. So we, we sort of know how a conflict goes and it does this and there's that and there's the adversaries and you have to fight it out or lose or whatever. Right. And nonviolence <laughs> often will rewrite the script of, of what's at stake. There's a story I like that I read decades ago now. Uh, a woman in one of these eastern towns, Baltimore or someplace, was coming home from work late at night, uh, you know, and it was like November, or December, or something, and so it was dark. And she was walking through this this urban neighborhood with two bags of groceries that she'd bought on her way home from work, and she could hear footsteps behind her, and she could just intuit that these were going to be menacing footsteps. And some guy was, it was obviously some guy's footsteps, and he was like getting closer to her. And when he got right behind her, she turned around and she thrust these two bags of groceries toward him and there's this instinctive response where if that's coming you just reach out your arms to grab them and she said these bags are awfully heavy would you carry these the rest of the way and and at that point the guy had her bags of groceries and she went down the block to where she lived she got out her key opened the door she said thank you very much she took them back in front of the guy and closed the door behind her and that was it but she rewrote the script so instead of being a crime victim um, she caused that guy to become uh, an unexpected helper. And so he, she changed his role in their interaction. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a creative nonviolent response. Well, that's not part of fight or flight. She did a third exactly. way. She exactly. rewrote the script about what was going on. Great example. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so many times, we, you know, we can, we can do things like that if we're open to a third way possibility. Um, there, there's a, a, a short poem, just a four-line thing that I like uh, by somebody named Edwin Markham. Uh, Heretic, rebel, thing to flout, they drew a circle that shut me out. But love and I had the wit to win, we drew a, cir a circle that took them in. So if you expand the circle, now everybody's included. And we don't have insiders right. versus outsiders. So again, it's a, it's a rewriting of right. what's going on. Um, a lot of people have misunderstandings about, about what nonviolence is. They kind of set up a straw man argument and then they argue against that, like they think nonviolence is weak right. or they think it's, it's uh, only useful in easy situations but not, not workable in, in hard situations. Tell us what some of those, those kinds of myths are and, and what your response would be. Right. Yeah, um, that it's less dynamic. Uh, we mentioned earlier that it, there are fewer options that you have if you choose nonviolence. Um, or that it's, it's what a weaker person will use, but if you're strong, you don't need to fall back on nonviolence. And all of those are wrong. I mean, the, the best examples of nonviolence that I know throughout history or um, person to person, like the example you gave, involves someone who, instead of falling for the the weak role in the story that you just told um, got creative and uh -huh. broke out of the stereotypes, took, you know, caught the other person off guard and, uh, like you said, rewrote the script, moved them into a different kind of mode. And that, I think that's one of the most important things about this subject, to understand that, um, A, a lot of the things we thought about conflict aren't right <laughs> or wrong, mm -hmm. and B, that this third option has vastly more possibilities than most of us imagine. Mm -hmm. That there are, and it takes reading, you know, stories or hearing stories. Mm -hmm. It takes um, experimenting to gradually discover which ones work for us or to take risks and try new yeah. ways of dealing with it and that, so forth. That, that's, that's one of the th fun things about reading uh, things that Gene Sharp has written. The, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. He wrote this classic book in the 
1970s where he, in the second volume of his trilogy, he lays out 198 different kinds of nonviolent resistance. Right. And as you get into that, you go, wow, there are lots and lots and lots of possibilities. And he says, you know, people will be figuring out more kinds beyond this. I mean, this was back in right. the 70s when he wrote that. And there have been right. more kinds indeed right. since then. And it works on, in really tough situations. I mean, I remember one time I, I do the conflict resolution for a number of homeless programs. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's something that could develop into a fight every week, um, mm -hmm. sometimes several sometimes four or five in a single afternoon. And I remember one where um, I was able to sort of move the two people outside. One of them was leaving and was, was a, sort of criticizing the other and I got between them. And anyway, we ended up outside and before I noticed, they each had drawn a box cutter out. Mm -hmm. Now you don't think of box cutters mm -hmm. as very good weapons, but remember that's what the uh, 911 uh, yeah. Yeah. terrorists used on those yeah. planes. Yeah. They're very sharp, and right. if you know where to use it, they're very deadly. And um, all of my instincts were to run uh -huh. <laughs> on the one hand, or to try to force my way um, and I had enough experience that I instinctively, or, or at least from, from a lot of effort, um, started just talking to them in a reasonably strong voice, but not a threatening voice. Mm -hmm. And I made sure I positioned myself so I wasn't in between them, but I could talk about the problem as being out here rather than me getting caught in the crossfire uh -huh. or them disagreeing with me. I wanted them to, to, to see the problem like that. And, and one of the things that I had to say and is really the basic piece is, you know, we can't allow knives in here. If you, you bring weapons, you're, you're banned for a month. And uh, if you do it again, you're banned for a year and you could be banned for life. And um, it was interesting to, to try out this strategy of just repeating again and again, you can't have knives here. And I I gradually moved to putting out my hands and asking them, let's have them. And finally, one of them just threw his knife against the concrete where the concrete met the uh -huh. sidewalk. The other handed me his. I walked over and picked up the other one, and I had both of their uh -huh. knives. Yeah. And it was, it was being patient. It was making sure that I didn't mm -hmm. make myself a target. It was asking for a favor from them or asking them to do something rather than demanding it. Yeah. And like you said, it was, I think together, all of those were unexpected enough that they did what I didn't even think I was gonna succeed at. Uh -huh. I thought I was gonna end up just getting them both out and make sure one goes one way and the other the other uh -huh. way, but I, I was actually able to disarm them. Well, and, and you, you mentioned that you were persistent enough, so you didn't say, well, geez, I, I've worked on this for 30 seconds or a minute. <laughs> I'm, gonna either, I'm gonna pull out a gun right. now and, and shoot you guys. You know, we've, right. we've tried diplomacy long enough. Now, yeah. now it's time for violence. Yeah, you wanna see violence, I'll yeah, show you yeah, violence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the normal story. Exactly. And, 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 and you tried a, a different way that, that, that worked. Right. You have a story about Paris in 1871. Yeah, this is it's, an amazing story. And, and I never read about this in the history books. Tell right. us that story. 1871, more than a thousand women tired of their sons and their husbands being caught up in this fruitless war with Prussia marched out of the city. They talked to, worked it through, you know, they mm -hmm. used their networks. Marched out of the city before dawn stood in front of the cannons on both sides and stopped the fighting. Mm -hmm. And it was, nobody was going to shoot these women. They'd been fighting for long enough that they were all pretty tired of it anyway. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so they were a little more open. But to actually have that not only delay the fighting for a half hour, uh -huh. <laughs> but actually get uh, one of the armies to sort of gradually pull back and withdraw it, it realized that it was going to suffer all kinds of consequences. And the other one not doing anything damaging back to them. Uh -huh. They succeeded in ending the, the fighting. Uh -huh. There's a, a, a better known case in the Philippines where the United States for a long time had been propping up and arming this really brutal right. thug, Marcos. dictator, yeah. Ferdinand Marcos. And um, the, the, what's referred to as the people power movement uh, got involved nonviolently. Tell us what was going on yeah. there. 
Well, again, uh, I mean, the Marcos had several hundred tanks, over a thousand planes. Um, you know, he could bring tens of thousands of troops to any point in the Philippines on a few hours' notice. Um, he had all of this power, but these everyday people in large enough numbers, you know, mm -hmm. they were tired of, of the uh, repression. They were mm -hmm. tired of their kids being snatched off the streets mm -hmm. and disappearing if they did anything at all. And, well, they, and, and he stole an election. Yeah, <laughs> not to mention. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, and he was stealing their money. Yeah, you know? yes. Um, he was, he was serving just the few and the many were being left yeah. behind. And they just started coming out and in lar large enough numbers that Marcos was powerless. Mm -hmm. And occasionally he would command his troops to fire. Occasionally a few of them would, but most of them wouldn't fire it. Mm -hmm. Particularly you'd, you'd see women in their dresses, nuns mm -hmm. in their habits. Yeah. And um, in the end, Marcos, dragging his tail behind him, <laughs> went with his wife to a plane and flew out of the country. His yeah. wife brought a few of her 2,000 shoes that yes. she was famous for yeah. um, and uh, exited. And the, the opposition never used violence. There were right. violence incidents at the margins and usually people not at all associated with it, yeah. but it was very minor and it did not touch the, the major demonstrations. Right. And it was a key part of nonviolence of depriving the opponent of the sort of respect for their power and the, the, the props that really allow yeah. a dictator to exist. And if people withdraw their support, um, that dictator can easily go the way right. Marcos went. Well, and people <coughs> learn how to do this because there was a lot of nonviolence training going on right. through churches and in other ways. Right. So people learned that, that kind of the thing. You pull away the exactly. props that keep the dictator in power right. and he'll collapse, and they learn how to stand up in difficult situations right. and remain nonviolent and strong and courageous right. and persistent. And so they were training. They, tremendous they were... numbers of examples you could give. I mean, just take World War II. Um, You've got um, uh, Finland. Mm -hmm. Finland was able to save all but six of its Jews mm -hmm. by all kinds of strategies. Um, Denmark, um, I mean, Norway. At the end of the war, the generals and the, the people that were in charge of trying to get like production out of the factories in these countries were literally wiring back to Berlin saying, let's just get out of here. We're putting more energy into trying to sub press these people than we're getting back in any kind of yeah. uh, um, production. And that's a pretty, you know, when it's the generals themselves in their honest communication, not, not their public pronouncements, are saying things like that, you start getting a whole different picture of the effectiveness of nonviolence. Yeah. So when, when one of the myths that we need to debunk and that we actually have been debunking on this program and will continue to debunk <laughs> is, is the, the myth that says, well, nonviolence is kind of moral and ethical, but not very practical. And the truth is it's practical and it works really well, right. um, much more so than people know because they don't teach that in history books. Right. History books are all about right. wars and generals and stuff. Right. And they're not written ab about nonviolence and they're also not written from the viewpoint of the people below. Right. They're written from the viewpoint of the people right. on top. And the tactics and ideas are endless. I mean, just to take the, the examples we just gave. Yeah. I, I love the story of the Danish Nazi um, troops forcing the Jews to all wear the, these the, gold the, stars, the yellow, the yellow, yellow stars. stars. Yeah. And the king decided he was going to put one on and uh, got the word out to other uh, people, make your own little yeah. yellow star and put it on. And it ended up being a total failure for the Nazis right. and a total success for beginning to mobilize people to see there are ways that we can fight this without picking up guns yeah. against a vastly superior force right. where we would be outclassed and, and out-trained and outnumbered. Right. And instead, to, to use more creative tactics, you know. Yeah, so they were allies with the people who were being picked on and it was kind of a right. smart ass in your face thing to the Nazis <laughs> right. to sort of um, nonviolently show uh, you're, you're not scaring us. We're, we're 
in solidarity with the people right. that you're picking on. Exactly. And it just deflates their power because an oppressor has to rely on fear to keep the people down. And when people right. refuse to be afraid, you know, the oppressor exactly. is uh, basically powerless. Um, we, I mentioned Gene Sharp a few minutes ago, and we should say some more about his, his uh, effect on the nonviolent movement, which has really been significant. Uh, in the 1970s, he wrote this three-volume set about looking at actual uses of 198 different right. methods of the middle The middle volume is entirely three or four yeah. or five pages on each one of those 198. 198 so it's, yeah. it's really yeah. not... The, He's not slipping it over anybody's eyes. Right, He's, yeah, yeah. This is real. Um, and, 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 and when he does speaking engagements or and in his writings, he says, I'm not a pacifist. I'm not pushing nonviolence because it's so moral. I'm, I'm pushing it because this actually works. Mm -hmm. It has a track record. Right. And, and so he, 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 again, counters this myth that, oh, it's only a nice moral ethical thing, but not practical. Right. And, and people have been using his books uh, and, and especially some of the more recent ones that are slim volumes, kind of how to do it manuals right. in a bunch of other countries. Right. They've been translated into over a dozen yeah. languages, including Arabic. Um, and it was really interesting. I remember there was a meeting of several of the Egyptian activists um, in another country. I think it was Greece. And... Uh, with them was this fellow from Bosnia, and they had, he had the mm -hmm. Bosnian version of one of the comic books that uh, yeah. the FOR put out on yeah. the Montgomery bus boycott. And um, uh, they, they all had copies of, this, of these sorts of material, from, mm -hmm. and particularly Gene Sharp. I mean, yeah. he's, he's really uh, played a role far beyond what the academics might have realized yeah. until it became, you know, Began coming yeah, out. he works with a nonprofit group, the Albert Einstein Institution, and people can visit the website uh, www.aeinstein.org. There are several other nonprofit groups with Einstein's name in them, and it'll get you into something that deals with physics or whatever. But this one is aeinstein.org, uh, and we'll include that reference at the end uh, with the closing credits. Um, uh, Gene, Gene Sharp said at one point, if you fight with violence, you are fighting with your enemy's best weapon. Mm -hmm. I thought, that's a good insight. Mm -hmm. And what, what nonviolence often true. does is find some clever strategic way right. to, to rewrite the script, to turn the tables mm -hmm. on them, to withdraw support. It's like Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, you know, we the people are going to create this country. Right. And and so Sharp's approach and the nonviolence approach from that standpoint is is very Jeffersonian. It should be as American as apple pie. If you go back to the colonial area, where people used a lot of nonviolent resistance right. in the colonial area, the, mm -hmm. they refused to pay taxes to Britain. They set up their own court system in Virginia instead of using the British court system, and on and on and on. You could make a good case, in fact, that the Revolutionary War was won in 1775, right, and that the physical violent part of it was just an afterthought. Yeah, the um, first first thing I read from Gene Sharp came out at the National FOR's magazine fellowship in 1976. Uh, and he made basically that point. He said that 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 the nonviolence campaign in as many forms was actually making really good progress. And once we started a violent war in 1776, then that got Britain to sort of say, oh, they can't push us around. We're going to send more troops. We're going to fight this war and all this kind of stuff. And, and, the, and Sharp was saying that the Revolutionary War actually prolonged the, the, the effort until we got independence. And if we'd stayed with nonviolence, right. we could have caused them to throw up their hands right. and say, oh, this is more bother than it's worth. Right. I mean, they, at the end of the war, they still had a vastly superior military. If they had ever wanted to withdraw it and bring it to the United States, uh -huh. they could have won everything yeah. they wanted. Yeah. Um, but it was the nonviolent campaign that got them to say, this isn't worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just walk yeah. away from yeah. this. Yeah. There, there's another researcher that, that who has very recently done some great work, uh, Erica Chenoweth, and Maria Stefan have written this wonderful book called Why Civil Resistance Works. And I read it and very much liked it, and some of my friends have read it, and we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. But they, they look at, in a, in a very meticulous way, 
uh, hundreds of, of resistance campaigns against oppressors since 1900, and they've been able to show that nonviolent resistance campaigns work better than violent ones, and we're more likely to end up with a democracy afterwards instead of more repression. And what part of what's fun about this is that Erica Chenoweth did not start out as a supporter of nonviolence. She right. never heard about Jean Sharp. She this actually is all totally new to her. She, yeah, she was a, a hard-nosed anti-terrorist, uh, the, the usual conventional kind of an approach to things, and she was doing research. And then this just caught her by surprise. And, right. and In fact, she was one of the people who said, if you take all of the examples of a people trying to resist a, a dictator or a, an oppressive force of some kind, let's say of the 20th century, that the majority of successful cases were by nonviolence. It's not just that this is a good idea, it has some skills to it, it works occasionally. It's actually been more successful than, than the approach that everybody assumes mm -hmm. is the way the, way the world yeah. works. I mean, I, and there are a lot of them that people don't realize. I mean, in our own hemisphere, three Latin American countries got rid of dictators by nonviolent means in the 40s. It's just our newspapers were filled with Europe and the, mm -hmm. the war that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And it would have been amazing to have that, you know, in the back of people's minds or on the front, on the pages of their newspaper mm -hmm. saying, wait a minute, <laughs> and begin questioning the assumption. Yeah. Or um, Eastern Europe, um, here Russia has all of this hardware and uh, 12 out of the 13 Eastern European countries and, and provinces of, of Russia achieve their independence by nonviolent mm. means. Primarily, well, even even South Africa, where for many years people could not see a way out of this because the apartheid regime was so brutal and so violent and so right. awful and so right. nasty, and the ordinary people, the black majority, were so poor that people could not see a way to get rid of the apartheid regime without a, a bloodbath. But it happened nonviolently. Right. It just caught everybody by surprise. And you know, there's an amazing uh, fact about that. Nelson Mandela was actually in charge of the military arm of yes. the American of the, uh, the African yeah, National, National Congress, Congress DNC, yeah. Yeah. and uh, ultimately, after years of using violent means, yeah. he was ready to be told by Desmond Tutu and a lot of other yeah. people, you know, let's try a different strategy yeah. here, and uh, to have to have that kind of conversion of somebody that we've come to admire yeah. the way right. we have. And, and for all the years he's been in prison, you would think that it would make him bitter and angrier and more violent, but he went the other way. Right. And, and it's that other way that worked, right. which is part of the point of this program. Right. Um, that, that one of those myths that we need to be uh, dispelling is the, the notion that nonviolence is weak. Uh, people talk about, people think that pacifism with an F, the peacemaking thing, is passiveism, P-A-S-S-I-V-E. Mm -hmm. right. Ism, and it's not. It's not weakness. It's not passive. It's active, and it's it's a different kind of power, not weakness. Right. Exactly. I mean, there were U.S. students that wanted to help, and they knew that U.S. corporations were sending military, mm -hmm. per, you know, material, and there were there were even discussions of like um, poking holes in ships and bombing them and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what they realized is they could do it by much more effective means that it couldn't be contested and that was going after their universities and and other places mm -hmm. to withdraw their investments yeah. from companies that were doing that business yeah. it became a worldwide phenomenon yeah. 60 percent of all u.s colleges were deeply involved in it right and it ultimately played a helpful role well sure they they got and and investors stockholders got their companies to stop their investments you know exactly. some of the, the big big corporations right. you know that were involved there one of the things that, that I, we should talk about in this program here is about how this also has roots in Christianity and other religions. And we're running a bit late on time because we've had all these great sure. stories to share. But I want to make sure that people understand that this is very much what Jesus was trying to do with his creative third world, right. a third way. And remembering that at his time, his country was being oppressed by the Roman Empire in a in a pretty nasty way that they right. ended up killing him. 
Right. Uh, so he was urging a nonviolent resistance to that oppression as a third way. Right. And it, can you tell us something of that? Sure. I mean, there are a number of examples of it um, in the Garden of Gethsemane in the sort of the pinnacle of the story of Jesus. Um, one of his disciples pulled out a sword and was going to defend them against the Roman soldiers. And Jesus said famously, put away your sword. They that live by the sword will mm -hmm. suffer by the mm -hmm. sword. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just not a solution. And um, it, there were many times that he illustrated that. I mean, one of my favorites is when he talked about turning the other cheek, which we misinterpret completely, mm -hmm. or um, someone oh. asks for your cloak, give them your undergarments yeah. as well, or the, go someone the asked you to, mile. yeah, go, to, mm -hmm. go the second mile. And it was that one that I, I find a particularly interesting because historians have discovered that, in fact, Roman soldiers had to carry this 60 or 70 pound pack around um, mm -hmm. when they moved, and they moved frequently. Um, they were, uh, would grab uh, some farmer off the side of the road and force him to carry the pack. Right. And, and Roman law authorized that right. for up to but one mile. After, after a while, they realized that it would, if you pull somebody very far away from their, their place, uh, whatever errand they were on, um, people start getting restless, people start getting angry. So the, the Roman leadership decided to put this limit on it, that you could only carry it one mile. So what Jesus is saying is, you get to the end of that mile, and the soldier says, okay, let's give it back. You turn the tables on him. You say, no, 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 it's okay. I'll, I'll carry it another mile. Now what does he do? Uh -huh. The soldier is like looking over his shoulder, making sure the centurion doesn't see it because the penalties were not trivial right. on the soldier's side. But, I mean, does he hit this person that's just carried his pack? You know, does he bro dig out his yeah. sword and say, okay, hand it over? I mean... He's been disarmed, and the and not only he has, you know, experienced this, but imagine the power that that gives to the to the person who at, says, "I'll carry it a second mile." Imagine what happens when he tells that story back mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. and all three of those examples and yeah. and a fair number of other ones that Jesus used have that kind of quality yeah. of Be, right because because that carry the pack thing. Um, if you're going to offer to do the second mile, you are getting that soldier in trouble. If, if you know, if you and, did, actually did it, yeah. and you are revealing the inherent oppression of even making you carry it the first mile. Right. So you're exposing that injustice and turning the tables on on the oppressor. Exactly. And like I say, the, the other stories are the same way. You know the, uh, and so it's it's. And, and those three stories come one after another. So it was clear that in writing that gospel that, that it was trying to make that point of right. a creative, nonviolent third way right. to um, right. turn the tables on oppression. Yeah. Um, in the, in the, and that sense of nonviolence carried on in the early church. There's just no, no history of early Christians joining the military. And in fact, many, right. some were executed because they refused to be drafted. Right. Yeah. No, um, the uh, early churches were, without exception, pacifists. And in, about half of them, you could not be a Christian and be in the military. They just didn't think that was possible. Mm -hmm. And so it put people in a difficult mm -hmm. position, you know, uh, trying to get out of the military and, uh, you know, in order to follow their faith. Um, and there are other examples. I mean, for example, the actual word that Jesus used for peace, shalom, meant more in his time than it does today. It actually mm -hmm. included fully our concepts of justice, of welcoming community, of wholeness. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, sh one example of shalom was somebody that's an opponent or an enemy of yours is caught in a sandstorm and happens to see your tent and comes and shouts your name, you go out and you bring that person into your tent. That's what mm -hmm. shalom meant. It's not some namby-pamby thing. 
but it's actually taking risks mm -hmm. um, for what is right. Mm -hmm. um, after the early church had maintained that peace witness and that shalom practice, um, at the time of Emperor Constantine, the church and state got tangled up together, and then the church leaders had to figure out how do we handle this conflict of interest right. when now we're part of the empire and the empire wants right. to go to war and how do we right. juggle this out? And, and, and St. Augustine and some others came up with the quote, just war theory where mm -hmm. they'd say, well, if, if we're gonna have a, oh, in order for a war to be just, it has to meet certain criteria. Right. In fact, it has to meet all of these certain exactly. criteria. And, and- uh, It's become the cover for countries ever since who have any significant population that's Christian. They'll fall back on that and say, well, we're, we're right in doing yeah. this. But you're right. If you look at those seven points, you, 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 you like think, how many wars have actually met all seven of those? Yeah. You know, that, that um, there was no other way than violence, for example, yeah. or that it had a serious chance of succeeding, yeah. um, et cetera. I mean, it was each one of them. Yeah, declared by a competent authority and not lied by the right. government to get us into a war that they knew was a, a sham, and also proportionality. Right. You know, we're not going to be killing people beyond the very few that we need to kill to prevail. And, you know, nuclear weapons, right. you know, where we, we might be killing hundreds of millions of people, right. well, no way would that meet just war criteria. Or even what we're doing in Afghanistan and Iraq and the drones in Pakistan. And, and I mean, on and on and on, we, we're not meeting the Vietnam War killed two million right. people in Vietnam. There was no proportionality, right. there was no chance of success, and they kept pushing ahead. I mean, we, we have wars that don't meet any of the just war criteria, right. but the just war theory says you have to meet all of these in order to be just, right. in order to be considered just. Right, it, it's, the experts are beginning to call it not just war theory, but justifying war theory. You're trying to justify your war yeah. by pulling out one or two of yeah. those and claiming that you've met them, but to meet all seven of the ones before the war and the other four during and after, yeah. you'd look in vain for a, yeah. a war that actually did. Yeah, and and there there has been this this uh, element of pacifism and nonviolence in the Christian faith on for you know throughout the whole history and in the modern era we have people like uh, the Quakers and the Brethren and the Mennonites, historic peace churches, right. and Dorothy Day and the Berrigan Brothers and Tolstoy, a hundred and some years ago, um, uh, people, uh, nuns and priests who are mm -hmm. trespassing on nuclear weapons plants right. to... There's even, a, there's even a mystery series. I think there are four of them with the word Quaker as the first word. Quaker uh, Testimonies is the uh, one that I just read. And uh, it's really interesting to get inside the mind of someone who, like I'm not a pacifist mm -hmm. and a Quaker, but to, to see someone actually go after a murderer with that kind of mindset and that kind of strong ethic uh -huh. is really fascinating. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, the Lutheran Peace Fellowship. You've been the national coordinator since 1994, right. and it's stronger and more effective than ever. I've been a member for decades, right. and I've very much appreciated what you've done for the Lutheran Peace Fellowship since you've been national coordinator for, well, it's been almost 20 years now. Um, Tell us something about what, what the Lutheran Peace Fellowship does. It's one of many um, religious peace fellowships that are part of the national right. level, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Sure. There's one in almost every denomination, yeah, like yeah. over a dozen. And, and more than you'd expect, because it's right. not just various Christian denominations, but there's the Jewish Peace Fellowship, and the Muslim Peace Fellowship, and the Buddhist Peace Fellowship, and so forth. Right. And so forth. Yeah. So w what is it that LPF does? Well, I would say, it, to narrow it down, there would be four things that I would mention. Um, one is workshops. We do an average of 100 a year just from our national leadership, and our members around the country are able to spark or encourage or lead even more than that. Um, we've done over 70 trainings, which is a day and a half, two days, a weekend, five days, where um, leadership training and peacemaking is one of the titles that we've used. And um, so over 1,000 people, over 1,400 people have gone through those, mm -hmm. those longer uh, trainings. So that's, that's a, a key piece. 
Another is just supporting the fellowship in exploring the kinds of ideas that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, our website has gets lots and lots of hits, and uh, um, we've put all of our resources. We have one on the Just Wharf, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. where you can actually see the criteria, and then there's two exercises on the back. One, using the Just Work criteria, and the second, going beyond it to what you might call Just Peace uh, option or alternative. Mm -hmm. So a third area would be um, um, resources. Um, and there, I guess, if I had to pick one, our computer activities have been used by more than a million people, and we're just in the process of revising the one that has been the strongest over the years uh, on budget priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, we do occasionally do work with the national church. Uh, mm -hmm. We've supported resolutions. We've... Um, been hired to lead workshops or to run uh, event staffs. Uh, we have, our Wall of Hope has been put in many, many events. Well, um, and tell, tell us about the Wall oh, of Hope. That's, a, that's an interesting process. It's a piece of cloth on which are put uh, over a hundred examples of nonviolence throughout history, successful examples like the ones we've mentioned mm -hmm. so far in the program. And... Um, under each one, there are drawings or photographs or other kind of materials, sometimes little pockets where you can pull a quotation out and take it along with you from that particular hero or whatever. Um, and there's a, it's pretty interactive. There are four places along the wall where there are questions and you write your answers on big sheets. Mm -hmm. We, If we have the people power, we've stationed people all along the wall to engage um, people and they become expert on some of the things that are a little less well known, mm -hmm. um, but and thousands of people, um, you know, have had an opportunity to see it. Yeah, you've mean, done this with youth, youth in youth yes. settings as well as adult settings. Right. I know oh, yes. Luther Peace Fellowship does a lot of good stuff with young people, right? And yeah. including a lot of good youth empowering work. Almost all of the youth gatherings of the Lutheran churches um, have featured that, and and then our, we'll have resource tables at the end. One time, they made peace flags which were hung on strings all across the area where this wall of hope was like 1500 people did it and what they were doing is a little uh visual reminder of what they were planning on doing when they got home what did i learn from this and how could i uh, try that out in my own setting mm -hmm. and very exciting mm -hmm. and then then besides these uh, religious peace fellowships that we mentioned there are a lot of other faith-based groups that work on peace and social right. justice. Uh, you think of like uh, the Shalom Center that has Jewish roots, Pax Christi that has Catholic roots, Pacha Ebene Sojourners that has evangelical roots, uh, Quaker-based American Friend Service Committee, right. uh, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture that right. connects with local congregations to oppose torture, Bread for the World that's been doing great hunger work for, what, about 40 years now. Right. Uh, Catholic worker movement going back to the 30s with Dorothy Day and Peter Moran. Right. I mean, there's a lot of lot of good stuff that's that's uh, faith based, where people can actually act upon right. their faith in the in the big world right. out there. Yeah, it's, I find it ironic that as a Christian, if I had to pick a single short book about the that came out after 911, mm -hmm. I would pick Pema Chodron's um, book. She's a Buddhist writer, yeah. but just so creative yeah. and so clear, getting beneath the ways in which we collude with with violence that that the United States began doing after yeah. the war, calling it a war on terror and so forth. Um, very interesting to see, and it's it's fun to learn from all these other yeah. options and yeah. rub shoulders with them at meetings and so forth. Right, it's it's, it's fun to read something about peace or social justice or nonviolence from somebody else's faith tradition. Or if you're not part of any faith tradition, pick one and read something sure. from that. I mean, it's just a way to to right. to, to stretch and grow. Um, uh, there's some more uh, resources we mentioned. Uh, Erica Chenoweth's book, and at the end of the closing credits, we'll have a, a website reference so people can connect with that. There with a um, there's an 81 minute presentation on YouTube, and if you fast forward through the the long-winded guy's introduction and get right into her presentation. Uh, it's still, you know, it's about 
70 minutes worth of good stuff and she just lays out the uh, the findings from the book and, and is very, very right. good. A Force More Powerful, similarly, it's Excellent. a video series. Yeah. It's a feature film, but it's also six 24-minute yes. segments that are just perfect for using in your public right. library or in a and we've church or synagogue, we've, et cetera. Yeah. And, and that's part of a, a, <clears throat> the, a Force More Powerful book that has about 13 case studies, and then six of those are made into those 24 minute videos and we've done those. We show one and have a conversation about it and then show one right. a week later and have a conversation and the Olympia FOR has a copy. People right. can uh, arrange with us. Uh, we mentioned Albert, uh, the Albert Einstein Institution, aeinstein.org. Uh, War Resisters League has been working on nonviolence uh, since the very early 20s and that's at www.warresistors.org and the National Fellowship of Reconciliation is at forusa.org. Uh, there are a lot of things around, um, and you mentioned there's a waging nonviolence. Right. That, that's very good. You mentioned that when we were preparing for or the show. One of the shortest ones is CNVC, the Center for Nonviolent Communication, which yeah. uh, it teaches ways of interacting one-on-one -on -one with mm -hmm. people in a more creative way. Yeah. So anyway, there's there's many, many. Right. One of the things that, that, that you uh, have, have done is, is work on this like at the family level. Right. And, and uh, you mentioned there's handinhandparenting.org. And if you could mention something, some right. insights about working with young well, people. It's, I, I'm a parent, so I know the, the sort of stresses that lead you to the point where you just want to holler at your kid. And uh, what they have figured out is that a lot of so-called misbehavior is just they don't have outlets for the kinds of stresses that we all experience. And uh, they have a, a particularly effective activity that was the centerpiece of what I drew from their work called um, uh, Special Time for the Child, where you, you just carve out a 20-minute time period and basically let the child do whatever he wants and follow him around, um, act a little dumb occasionally, uh, it, in order to, to allow the child to really move it forward. And pretty quickly, they, if they get the idea that it's a safe space, they will start working on the stresses that they've experienced since you last did it. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so it's worth it just for what you can learn from it, but it's, it's just amazing. Like, for example, supermarkets, you take a child to a supermarket, it's, it's almost a trap because, you know, the people have spent millions of dollars designing covers of boxes of cereal and displays of cans that make you want to grab it and put it in your cart. Well, your child doesn't have a cart, so he's going to grab it. <laughs> and uh, so the no amount of hollering that goes on in a supermarket is pretty, pretty high. I can hardly go into a supermarket where I can't hear somewhere some conflict between a parent and a child. And I found that I would just kneel down and give my son that five or ten minutes of time he would let loose whatever it was that was the problem, and we'd go in and he'd be great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's, there's a variety of dimensions to yeah. this, including parenting. Yeah, you, you have a, an example, and we're gonna be wrapping up here in just a couple of minutes, but I wanna squeeze in this story that you have of a 13-year-old boy who was walking with a friend in a park, right. and they were getting harassed by a group right. of four boys. Four boys uh, surrounded him. And one of them in particular started harassing him and saying things like, you know, what's your friend, homosexual, used a lot worse word than that for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, who is he? And basically trying to carve him away from the older of the, or the taller of the two mm -hmm. boys. And he d wouldn't fall for it, but he also wouldn't fall for becoming irritated or violent. So he neither ran away from the problem and caved into it out of fear, nor did he become aggressive at, at this kid, mm -hmm. even though he went so far as to shake one of the drinks and get it all over one of the mm -hmm. kids. Yeah, one and, of, the, one of the, the harassers or, yeah. shook the drink, yeah. Or another, another uh, skill of nonviolence is to divide your opponent. So he was very careful not to um, imply that he was criticizing the other three. So it gradually isolated the one that ah. was doing the bad stuff. Okay. And it ended up, they walked away from it. 
Uh-huh. And it's an example of someone who's just been around nonviolence uh, practice from his parents, um, acting in a in the kind of creative, uh, mm-hmm. effective manner that we've been talking about yeah. here in a situation that could have gotten very dicey. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, pe- people, the the more people have examples of the kinds of stories we've been sharing and the kinds of stories right. that are in these various resources that we've been discussing the more people have tools in a toolbox where something comes along and they can pull out a tool from what they've heard right. and, 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 and use it. And so we can, we can build the repertoire and, and, exactly. and add to the toolbox. Well, I want to thank you for being our guest. This has uh, been a lot of fun and that hour went quickly. Uh, so I want to thank Glenn Gershmel for being our guest. I want to thank my all the- my privilege, thanks. Uh, thanks. I want to thank all the folks who've been watching uh, we need to know that nonviolence is both powerful and practical. David Dellinger, a longtime nonviolent activist for peace and social justice, said, the theory and practice of nonviolence are roughly at the stage of development today as those of electricity in the early days of Marconi and Edison. A lot of books and articles and documentary films and training workshops and other resources are available and some are especially tailored for certain kinds of people, like parents, uh, people of particular religious faiths, and so forth. The Lutheran Peace Fellowship has a lot of resources. The other websites that we'll be listing at the end of the program also are very good starting places. You can also contact the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation, and we can connect you with additional resources. We're at 360-491-9093 and www.olympiafor.org. We're all one human family and we all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to do our part. And the world needs what you have to offer. Thanks.